I'm Ken Jacobson, Senior Documentary Programmer, AFI Festivals, and I want to welcome you to AFI Docs 2021 Industry Forum and to this session, Inside Investigation, What Filmmakers Need to Know to Embark on Investigative Documentaries. First, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor of the forum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, our AFI members, and of course, you, our audience. And, and I also want to thank our moderator and all of our panelists, as well as our two ASL interpreters. Please note that if you have questions, please include those in the chat, and we will feed those to the moderator for our Q&A at the end. Speaking of which, our moderator, Carrie Lozano, is director of the Sundance Documentary Film Program. She's also a first-rate filmmaker, the former director of the IDA Enterprise Fund, and former executive producer of Al Jazeera America's documentary, Strand. Needless to say, she knows a lot about investigative documentaries from multiple perspectives, and we're thrilled to have her lead this discussion today. Our panelists will be introducing themselves in just a moment, but I just want to give a shout out to them now. Sarah, Dale, Abby, Mark, and Sonia, thank you so much. Carrie, thanks for leading our discussion today. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Ken. It's a pleasure to be here at Docs Forum. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. I'm really appreciative of the goals of today's session. Uh, the goal is really to crack open in an instructive way how the sausage is made and what methods filmmakers can pursue to tell investigative stories. And so I just wanna jump right in. I know time is of the essence and I wanna to get to as much of the content as we can. Um, so I'd love to bring up our speakers and have each of you really briefly introduce yourselves. And for more information about these wonderful panelists, you can see their bios online. And I think we'll share some links in the chat too. But Sarah, would you mind kicking us off? Of course. Um... Hi, thanks so much for having me. My name is Sarah Childress. I am the series senior editor at Frontline. And Abby, why don't we go to you next? Thank you for having me. My name is Abby Ellis and I'm an independent filmmaker and I was the writer, director and producer of Flint's Deadly Water. Thank you. And Sonia. Hi, I'm Sonia Son, and I am the director and executive producer of The Slow Hustle. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks for being here. And Mark. Mark Levin, great to be here. And I'm the executive producer of The Slow Hustle. And last but definitely not least, Dale. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Dale Cohen. I'm the special counsel for, for the Frontline series. Uh, and a colleague of Abby and Sarah. I also run a pro bono documentary film legal clinic at, at UCLA School of Law. Thank you all so much. And so I think um, because we wanna really get into um, a, a deep dive discussion here, what we're going to do is um, ask Abby and Sarah to bring their cameras up and the rest of our panelists will join us later in the discussion. But we're going to kick off by really focusing on the episode about the Flint water crisis. And I was really struck by this film. So congratulations. I know it's won several awards. And um, what was unique about it, I think, is it was kind of the story that we didn't hear. It was a really critical but underreported part of what happened in Flint. So I'm wondering, Abby, if you could just set it up for us. You know, how did you um, not only come upon the story, but then decide that you were going to make this into an investigative film. Definitely. So I think, um, you know, we we knew that there was a bigger story to tell, um, but there were, I mean, there were a lot of, of stories that hadn't been reported. And the one that stuck out um, was this idea that more people had died during the water crisis than the state had let on. Um, and we heard about this guy who was working part-time at a coffee shop to afford to go through death certificates to publish a story with the Detroit News about these deaths. So he had built this database of all of these, these pneumonia deaths. And it sounded really crazy at the time, um, as a lot of these things do at the very beginning. So um, we tracked him down and it turned out to be true, you know, and then we spent the next year um, 
verifying some of the stuff that he had uncovered and 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 and, and building a story around it. Um, but it was one of those stories that was really it came to fruition. I mean, we we lived there and we were in the field and we were knocking on doors and we were just finding, you know, more and more people had died from pneumonia than uh, than anybody had admitted to. So it was it was it was kind of it came to us while we were there trying to figure out what the story what the bigger story was, this seems to be undoubtedly the most important story we needed to get to the bottom to the bottom of. Yeah, and the watching kind of the journalism unfold, and I don't I don't recall the kind of the coffee shop anecdote. I don't know if that made it into the film, but it's really fascinating. And that's kind of a discussion we're gonna have later. And Sarah, I'd love to bring you in. I mean, given your lens at Frontline overseeing these films, you know, when a, when you're launching a story like this, which is really truly, it's not an explanatory film, it's enterprise reporting, it's original reporting, um, and then hearing that backstory of, of this reporter sitting in the coffee shop trying to build this database. I mean, what are some of the just practical considerations and questions that you, um, from your perspective, have as you're launching into a film? And a, I think a really big investment, because you don't necessarily know what's going to be uncovered or where it's going to go. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the toughest things about doing an enterprise, you know, investigative journalism film. Um, like Abby said, you often don't know if you've got it. Um, it takes time, right? It takes time and resources to really delve in. Um, but there were a couple of factors that made us feel like the story was really worth um, worth telling and figuring out. Um, you know, first of all, you know, the Flint water crisis, um, I'm actually from Flint. So I had a, I had a vested interest in, in, uh, in telling the complete story if there was more to be told. Um, you know, it was really unreported. Um, you know, we know that, you know, at the death of local media, there just isn't a whole lot there. Um, and so, you know, when I started talking with Abby and she was telling me, um, that there was, you know, what they were hearing was that there was a lot more to the story and it wasn't just the lead crisis, which is really what, you know, what was the national story? Um, you know, so for us, for it to be a front line, it needed to go beyond what everybody sort of knew or thought they knew, right? Um, and, you know, and show us that we could really tell something revelatory, um, you know, with enough time and, and resources, which is, you know, we're fortunate enough to be able to bring to a story. Um, and that was the case here. You know, this was something really original, um, you know, a story nobody had heard about, this Legionnaire's d disease outbreak, um, which was completely different from the lead crisis, right? Um, so it was a different story. And there was a real accountability angle here, um, you know, because the other question that people really hadn't um, been able to get to the bottom of was, you know, sort of how this happened and, you know, could it have been prevented, right? Um, you know, was this wasn't just sort of a terrible environmental crisis. This was something that was man-made. Um, and so for us, that accountability angle and the revelation that this was, you know, perhaps even more serious than it already was, um, you know, made us feel like this was worth, you know, taking the time to really get to the bottom of and, and to do it right. Right. And the, you know, for the filmmakers in the audience who are thinking about engaging in this work, I mean, I think at the core of all of this is accountability. That's always the question, right? Um, who's responsible and who benefits are kind of the two big questions that we're all seeking to uncover. I would love to roll the clip because um, it kind of leads into the next question um, and also a larger discussion I want to have about the kind of nitty gritty scientific nature of this story as well. And so um, if we could roll the clip, I think it will give us a really great grounding into how, how you both approach the story. Over several months, frontline reporters analyzed every death record in the county during a seven-year period, looking for people whose cause of death had been listed as pneumonia. You have to go through every single death certificate one by one because there was really no other way to do it. You can't go digging up bodies and, you know, doing antigen tests on bones. I started just going through just the time frame of the switch, and I started counting the pneumonia deaths that I found. I thought I was crazy when I was looking at it because I kept finding more, not less. The state had put the death toll from the Legionnaires outbreak that ran from 2014 to 2015 at 12 people, but Frontline found dozens who were said to have died of pneumonia in the same period. There was this spike during the switch it was almost three times more than prior years. As Michael Murray and his team feared, there were signs the outbreak's toll could be higher than anyone knew. 
why wasn't a thorough investigation launched from the state? I mean, this raises some very critical questions if you knew at the time that people were dying. So I just want to let the audience know that PBS Frontline and all its episodes are available. They're on YouTube, they're on the PBS platform, um, they're online, so you can access them. Um, this, this clip is really great because I think it does um, reveal what is kind of the less glamorous part of our work, which is really like going through documents, creating databases, and going to original sources. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering, Abby, if you can speak to that. I think people don't, sometimes they just don't understand that, like, that's actually where we get the facts, which is to just pour through death certificates, autopsy reports, you know, CDC data, we'll, we'll get there, um, and, and just to try to piece together what happens. So can you talk a little bit um, for our audience about that process? Definitely. Um, you know, it was it was the first time I had done a, an investigation that involved um, health um, and, and and people's people getting sick and people dying and involved. You know, there's a lot of documentation involved in that. When you get death records, when you get um, you know, a lot of these people had been in the hospital for years prior. Um, and one thing I know that we needed to do that was actually quite tedious that you don't see in the film is you know share these records with infectious disease experts, multiple. Um, it, it feels sort of, it feels sort of, you know, not great in the moment when you have to, when you have to just verify that somebody experienced what they say that they experienced. But of course, in our case, we do because we just need to be as bulletproof as possible. So um, while it looks like we just went through all of these death certificates and counted them, what actually happened is we went through all of these death certificates for a large majority of them we went door to door um, and met the families or people who uh, lived there previously and and asked questions you know like what was your water like during this time frame do you remember people working outside do you remember anyone from the state or city coming to talk to you about your water did your loved one who passed away experience these symptoms we actually were given a packet from um, uh, a doctor at the time who, who, who told us like all of the questions we need to ask to determine whether or not maybe this person had a type of pneumonia that was similar to the legions, like the type of re investigative reporting that scientists and doctors would do if they were allowed to finish this investigation. But of course they weren't. So we kind of had to step into this like epidemiologist space <laughs> that was new, but, um, it was, it, you know, it yielded so, so much information. And, and I think, um, I, I think what people do less now and was so powerful for us in this film was actually going door to door and meeting people and confirming stuff that way. And then bringing all of the documentation and stuff like that to the experts so that they can verify, yeah, this person died of, you know, we, we found all these people who died of pneumonia and we wanted to confirm that it, it may or may not be linked to this bacterial outbreak, you know? And so we, we just had to have independent experts, experts who didn't work in the state of Michigan. So they weren't, you know, even tangentially involved in this very litigious political by now issue. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of, it was, it was a lot of work. It took, it took a long time tracking people down. Sometimes you go to houses and nobody lives there anymore. You know, and, and so it was a lot of work, but we had a team of three people and then we had Sarah in Boston, you know, helping to guide us. And, and that's, that's how we, that's how we did that portion of the film. We could do a whole hour on the door to door and anytime I'm working with students, like, you know, that's a big conversation, especially pe for people who've lost someone and lost a loved one and what that means to kind of show up and start asking questions. And so Sarah, I'd love for you to weigh in and, and we're about to kind of close out this piece of the discussion, but you know, Frontline has been on the forefront of a lot of the pandemic reporting this year. And so, you know, these, we all have become kind of our armchair scientists, armchair epidemiologists through this work. And I'm just wondering, so Sarah, if you can talk a little bit about um, from your perspective, um, 
you know, what it takes to start to go down a scientific path when you're telling these stories? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think it's one that we were very conscious of um, ensuring that we did right um, and in a transparent way, um, you know, because ultimately we are journalists, we're not scientists. So we weren't trying to be the experts. We were trying to um, gather everything that we could from the experts themselves and present to viewers what we could learn, right? So we went to the top experts on Legionnaire's disease. It turns out there's a cohort of people who have devoted their lives to studying this rare disease that most people don't know much about. So we talked to all of them um, and we asked them all the same questions. And, you know, it's important too that we went into this very, in a very open-minded way. Like we weren't trying to sort of, you know, gather all the evidence that proved that Legionnaire's disease was the cause of all these people's deaths. We really wanted to understand whether it was possible, what was possible, um, what are we missing? Um, you know, when we decided to do, you know, when we started counting the death certificates, that was actually experts suggesting to us that that was a way we could approach it. So we were following experts' guidance along the way and checking every step with them along the way. Um, some of them are featured in the film. Some we just spoke with as great sources. Um, and we just were always searching for expert opinions. And if they disagreed, we asked more people, you know, we really wanted to make sure. And then we were transparent about what we knew and what we didn't know too. You know, we know that there's, you know, for Legionnaire's disease, there's no way to know definitively if someone died from it, if they've passed away and were never tested. So we can never say for sure, right? But what we can say is what we, you know, in all likelihood, where the science points according to experts. And we tried to be really clear and transparent about that um, throughout the film and the reporting. Thank you so much, Sarah and Abby, and we'll come back to you shortly as we bring up the panel, but I'd love to bring up um, Mark and Sonia now to talk about the slow hustle. Hi, Mark. Hey there. And then do I see Sonia somewhere? I hope so. Um, my screens are bouncing back and forth. So the slow hustle is having its world premiere at AFI. Congratulations. Um, I think you have an actual in-person live screening today, if I'm not mistaken. There is one today, yes, yes. So Sonia, I'd love for you to kind of set up um, the context for this film. I mean, this film looks at um, what appears to be the murder of a, an officer in Baltimore um, under really questionable circumstances and really delves into um, a lot of the corruption that's, that's, that's been part of the history of the Baltimore PD. And this, of course, follows your film, Baltimore Rising. So I'd love for you to just set up the film for us and then to follow that with the clip so that we can kind of share with the audience um, what your investigation delves into. Uh, so in October, excuse me, in November of 2017, Detective Homicide Detective Sean Souter was uh, died in an alley um, in Baltimore. Um, it happened to be the night before the premiere of Baltimore Rising, um, and uh, oddly enough, you know, we were all excited about the one film, and it had been quite a long haul. So when this had occurred, it resonated. Uh, with us and sort of sent a sort of resounding sort of like domino, um, sort of fall of dominoes, I guess, um, through, our, um, through our crew. And it really struck us as being um, um, sort of a part of the larger story, but um, also um, a bit, um, um, I guess for us at that point in time, it, it, it seemed to be a another chapter of the same story that would have been a big undertaking. Coming from where we had come from, we were not looking in that direction. We were thinking, you know, this is a story that needs to be told. However, we're not sure if we're the ones to do it. Um, as six in the in the six months that followed, um, as the story sort of unraveled, um, I, I found that there were elements of this, um, social elements to this story that really did speak to Baltimore Rising. And it became more and more clear that um, possibly this team, you know, might, um, might have some insight um, to sort of share if we dove into the story. Um, and so what, what began as a possible murder investigation um, evolved into an investigation um, of this officer's death that could have had three different conclusions. And so that's where we pretty much start our, um, our film, six months after 
the death of Souter, a lot of the um, action having already taken place and the family and the people of the city, um, their sort of mindsets and they were sort of weary of the onslaught of corruption cases. Um, and so we sort of went into that atmosphere to begin telling the story. I would love to touch on that, but why don't we roll the clip and then we'll we'll um, ask Mark to kind of, you know, talk further about what it means to pick up a story kind of as it's unfolding and as it's fresh and the stakes are incredibly high here. Um, so why don't we go ahead and roll the clip? It was a lot of reporting about what he knew, what he didn't know, what he was going to testify to. Was he going to get pulled into this big, massive scandal? Was he a dirty cop? Was he a dirty cop? Did he off himself in an alley? Is this suicide? Or did someone along the way in the police department make sure he was killed so he wouldn't testify to what he knew? We don't know. Did he have damning evidence on other officers in the department? We don't know. So Mark, I'd, I'd love to bring you into this conversation and you know, you've been doing this work for a long time, have worked on a number of films and series. Um, but you know, this, this case in particular um, was very fresh and, and the allegations are really serious or the potential ramifications are really serious. So when you're kind of launching into a story like this and, and as Sonia just said, as Baltimore Rising was just coming out, what are the considerations that are kind of going through your mind about how and if you should proceed? Well, um, I think uh, the first is whether uh, who's willing to talk. Uh, there's an advantage and disadvantage of, uh, you know, kind of the immediacy. Obviously, you're in the center of the action. Uh, everything is heightened. Uh, and uh, you've got a sense of the drama unfolding. So that, that's a positive. At the same time, people are reluctant, as, as Sonia was referring, uh, weary uh, from all the scandals and, and corruption uh, and tragedies. And so uh, they're not ready to talk. Sometimes visiting five years later, 10 years later, uh, looking back, people are ready to open up and say, okay, I've never told this before, and now I'm ready to. Uh, so it's balancing those two. And, and as you said, in the middle of all of this is um, uh, the eruption of uh, the, the social justice movement, uh, you know, after the tragic uh, death of, of George Floyd. Uh, and here you have a, a black man uh, who's found with a, a bullet hole in his head but he happens to be a cop. Uh, but that doesn't mean that some people don't suspect that other cops killed him. Um, and uh, so it was explosive in that way. And uh, trying to balance the different perspectives that people bring to a story like this, uh, I think was a challenge for us. And uh, Sonia made a wise decision to uh, kind of have a variety of storytellers, journalists, um, and I guess to your audience, you know, that is certainly one way of uh, as a filmmaker and as a starting filmmaker is to partner with an investigative journalist, a storyteller, an author, uh, a whistleblower, uh, somebody uh, on the inside. Now, that can even be you. In other words, I'm saying on a personal level, there can be offenses or, or, or things that have happened that you want to investigate and, and you can be that uh, point of access that eyewitness, um, but in this case, I, I think the, uh, the the three conventional journalists, and then Sonia added D. Watkins, who is a, an author, a professor, but who comes from the streets of uh, Baltimore, and and certainly added, um, you know, I think a really original and unique perspective. Yes, yeah, Sonia, that's actually one of my questions, Mark and Sonia. I'm wondering if you could talk about that decision because you do have these three different perspectives um, coming in, and but they come in with some amount of kind of objectivity, if you will, you know, and round out the story. You also have the family, um, you know, that you've talked to um, and kind of getting their perspective and, and what 
what it means to them to resolve this case and really what's at stake. So talk about your sources a little bit, Sonia, and kind of how you identify, you know, who, who would help kind of unravel this mystery for us. Yeah, um, I suppose, you know, it's one of these cases where you sort of learn what you're good at and what you're not good at. <laughs> You know, or put it this way, you know, where you, where your expertise lies, you know, where, you know, where's my sweet spot and, you know, not having a journalism degree and also sort of understanding that, you know, just generally speaking, I'm pretty passionate about my viewpoint. And with documentary, you're really forced to kind of rein in some of um, that or I don't say rain in, but just really put your passions and emotions for a subject matter or a particular perspective underneath, you know, a microscope. And so I felt that having a couple of different journalists, a few different journalists would be sort of like a safety net for the film. Um, and also, you know, would just keep us the whole team on, tr on track. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and you know, just to kind of wrap up this piece of the conversation, I mean, one of the things that's very striking is, you, you know, you, you're going back and you're piecing something together and we're working in a visual medium. And so in your film, you have body cam footage, there's some recreations, if you will, and just like, you know, a really nice aesthetic um, to kind of stitch together the information. And I'm just wondering if you both can talk about, you know, how you approach that, that th these are really complex stories. There's a lot of facts at play here. And then of course the voices, um, but how do you approach it visually? What are you thinking about and what are you looking for? Well, I'll kick it off Mark and I'll, let, I'll, I'll toss it to, to Mark um, because Mark um, was very helpful. Um, I certainly, I had um, um, some, uh, lots of ideas on how I wanted to present this information visually, given that, that you know, I, I've, just my experience with investigative documentaries um, and my own experience coming from more dramatic, um, you know, uh, uh, genres, um, just kind of wanting to bring a little bit more of that to that sensibility visually to this documentary so that it wasn't just an onslaught of like facts and archival because we were really coming into this this case even though it was sort of immediate we were sort of in that weird spot where it wasn't exactly immediate where you're there and folks are in it and they want and they're talking because you know they're feeling some things and they have some either some passion immediately that they want to get off their chest. And we were not so far away from the event that they've thought about what they want to actually share. So we was in that spot where everyone was very hesitant. And so it seemed as though there was going to be just a lot of facts to, to, to present. And so how could we do that and also give some illustrations um, when we didn't have access to a lot of the, um, some of the police, um, like we, we, we received the police body cam footage during the edit. We, we you know, very late in the game. Excitedly, so, I imagine, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, because we were, we, you know, we, we, we created those other recreation scenes, you know, right. so then that it helped us actually, you know, that actually, you know, helped with the sort of continuity. But I'm going to hand it over to Mark because, um, you know, just being experienced as Mark is with, you know, so many decades of filmmaking behind him and sort of me sort of bringing, you know, these ideas to the table. It, it was important to work with Mark um, and Daphne and the whole team on how to actually uh, uh, ensure that that became, that was a fluid sort of, um, uh, fluid sort of delivery. Right. If that makes sense. Mark, you want to pick that up? I want to first of all just say, you know, Sonia and I have known each other for quite a while. I mean, we made a movie together 20 uh, some years ago, Slam, that, that won Sundance. And so, you know, this is a great creative partnership and dialogue that we've had over the years. And, you know, um, and, and so her sense of uh, coming out of the dramatic world and the scripted world I think it, it made sense to try to come up with certain way to stylize this film because in the end, where as we started, okay, who killed Sean Souter? It kind of morphed and evolved into more what and why did Sean Souter die? And right. there was a Rashomon element to it that leads to this larger issue of the corruption of, uh, 
of the Baltimore police, but really urban policing and where we are today and poverty and the war on drugs and, and many of these other issues that, you know, brought it, Sonia and I together, you know, 25 years together, uh, ago when we did SLAM. So uh, I think that, that, that led us to kind of try to find an aesthetic, like you're saying, a style, a sense that it wasn't, you know, just, okay, you're gonna find out here's the smoking gun you know, and he did it or she did it, you know, no, this is going to lead in, a, in another direction. And, and Dee was certainly, and, and all the journalists were really part of that. And, and the journalists had different opinions. And even the scientific experts, as in your previous discussion, you know, there was a, an official uh, looking at it uh, the, called the IRB, and they concluded one thing, and the medical examiner concluded the total opposite thing. So even amongst the so-called experts, you were getting this Rashomon effect. And to, to kind of allow the audience the, the, the experience of going through, and I think it happened this way, no, now I think it happened this way, not get confused and yet build to asking larger questions about what was really going on and really about how we police ourselves, you know, and, and what the role of police is. Um, I think it required a certain stylization, which, you know, Sonia, I think uh, pulled off. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And I will we'll bring you back momentarily, but I'd love, this is actually a perfect segue into discussion with Dale Cohen, because um, Dale, what you have to straddle as um, legal counsel for some of these films is um, kind of the aesthetic imperatives, the dramatic imperatives with the facts. Um, and so Dale, I'd love for you to just kind of, you know, jump in here and talk about um, what you're looking at, you know, how you're looking at films. And um, I, I don't want to use the word interrogation, but I think I think I will, you know, and kind of interrogating them and, and, and meshing the, the visual treatment with the actual information that's being conveyed. So I hate the word interrogation, first of all, but but you're absolutely right. I mean, my art, the process, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I get to work with all these creative filmmakers and journalists both at Frontline and, and, and through the UCLA clinic. And, and a big part of the process, as you know, Carrie, is, is getting to know each other, right? Getting to a place where there's a level of trust, which is largely based on, on the lawyer, whoever it is, whether it's me, one of my clinicians, a colleague or somebody else, getting to know the filmmaker and what the filmmaker is really trying to accomplish. Because after all, at the end of the day, the filmmakers get final cut. I mean, one of the mistakes that lots of people make and is thinking that the lawyers say, you can't do this or you can do that. It, it's not up to the lawyers to decide that. I mean, you know, the job of the lawyers is to help the filmmakers get across the goal line to, to complete their film and tell the story they want to tell, but to do it without undue risk, without unnecessary risk, and helping them to do exactly the kinds of things that Sonia and Mark and Abby and Sarah have all been talking about, which is making sure that they're getting it right. Um, and that's not just for legal risk, as you know, it's also for the credibility of the film, right? right. You don't want the film to be open to criticism after the fact by Monday morning quarterbacks who say, you got this fact wrong or you got that fact wrong. And so part of our process as lawyers is to help the filmmakers find the right way to be sure that they've got a really solid story. Right, I mean, I think all of you combined are exactly why I really love this work is because it's complicated. Um, and because we don't know the answers and because we're kind of searching for truth, you know, that's, that's what we're looking for. And sometimes the truth is very murky. You know, Dale, working with both of your lenses, working, you know, at Frontline, often with incredibly seasoned veteran reporters, and then working at the clinic with more emerging filmmakers, I guess, you know, maybe this is an unfair question, but, you know, what are some of the, the common mistakes that are made? What are some, some things that you've gleaned over the last number of years um, that you could share with the audience about, like, you know, how do you set yourself up well to do this work if you don't have the apparatus of Frontline or HBO or another strand? 
Right. Um, well, I, I, I think you actually, the audience got to hear from, from Sonia and Mark a little about that. I mean, one of, one of the, and actually Abby mentioned it as well. You, you need to find the right resources to, to help you on that. Whether it's independent experts like what, what Abby and, and Sarah found to help them with the science, or it's finding trained journalists who know the area and have, have bring an objectivity and a fact-checking orientation to it. Uh, any of those things, I and mean, frankly, more smart people is, is what I, I find is the most important thing for getting these stories right and doing it well. I mean, when you think about the legal disasters that have happened to journalists or to filmmakers in the last few years, I think almost all of them involve situations where established processes were either subverted or ignored or where people kind of went off on their own and lone ranger the story and made a mistake based on their own suppositions and their, their honestly held beliefs that, that they knew what the story was but there was no one there to say, are you really sure? And, and so part of the fun for me, even though it can be hard at times, is that, that you know, I was raised in a tradition of journalism. I was at the Chicago Tribune for many years and, and they had the city news bureau within the Chicago Tribune had a catchphrase that I repeat all the time, which was, if your mother tells you that she loves you, check it out. <laughs> um, and and I, I remind myself of that all the time because we, we all come to these kinds of stories, to our journalism, to our films, believing that we know certain things. And it's really important that we cross check our, our beliefs and, and make sure that, that with the help of others who might have a different perspective, who might see things a little differently, that we're, that we're thinking about it a little more broadly. And in the end, that helps not only the credibility of the film, but if you do run into legal problems, one of the things that's so critical is to be able to persuade judges, juries, opposing lawyers that you tried to be fair, that you really did you know, run down all the leads, check out all the different ideas. Right. And I think, I mean, I think this, this leads to kind of the, the final question I'd like to ask before we bring up all the panelists, which is, you know, I, I feel like filmmakers sometimes are a little bit confused about the law and the difference between um, maybe entertainment law or, you know, setting up your company and actually, you know, First Amendment law um, and, and, you know, lawyers who come from the newsroom like the Chicago Tribune. I mean, we're not always talking about the same element of law. We're not always concerned with the same things when we think about those different buckets. So, um, you know, if we're trying to kind of crack open this work for people, you know, it, briefly, can you tell us the difference? You know, what's the difference between um, entertainment law or, you know, assessing, um, you know, some sort of risk for, say, for a corporation versus actually um, law that helps us do our journalism? That, that's an interesting question, Carrie, and, and, and I don't think we have all, all too much time to, to explore in it. 60 but, seconds or less. <laughs> okay, in 60 seconds or less. I, I think the entertainment law side is more about the business dealings with your distributors, the platforms, the way that you're going to get the deal done and the way you interact with the people who are working with you, your crew members, your composer, your, your editors, et cetera, et cetera. The journalism side of things, there are lawyers who are really good at helping with pre what we would refer to as pre-broadcast or pre-publication review. There are some people that do both. We try to do both at the UCLA clinic you know, on, on our pro bono basis. Uh, don't deluge me with requests, although I'm happy to hear from anyone who's, who's interested, but, but as you might imagine, we get lots and lots of requests. Um, but those are the key differences. And, and one of the things that makes it really interesting to do both and to straddle it the way we do is on the entertainment law side of things, the, the, the companies that are used to doing narrative films or feature films have a somewhat different set of rules than journalists. And one place I'll point to and then I'll stop is releases. I mean, people who, who cross over these lines, if you're working on on you know, an entertainment film or a documentary for a big platform, they want releases from everybody, right? If you come from the journalism world, you know, 
uh, people in newspapers never get a release from an interviewee. <laughs> you know, who would hand a piece of paper to somebody that you're talking to to ask them for information, even if you're taking photographs of them? So there are, there are differences that are usually based on business considerations. So I'll leave it at that for right now. Okay, that's helpful. And I think to me, the big point I want to get across is that there are differences. And then <laughs> as, you're engaged, as you're engaging in, engaging in this work to really do your homework as you would with all other things to really start to understand what it is that you do or don't need. So I would love to bring up our filmmakers now and kind of open up the discussion and really encourage the audience to start to, if you haven't already, to put your messages in the chat and your questions in the chat. Um, time will run short here. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we can address things for you. But um, but but Sonia and Sarah um, and I can't see if I if Abby's up yet, but I'd love to invite you back. And I, I think, you know, Abby and Sonia, I'd love to kind of kick off a more general conversation with the two of you. I mean, um, Mark said it well, it's like, who's who's going to talk? I mean, that is the question. And I think that's what's so hard about investigative documentaries is like, you need people to go on camera. It's one thing to have off the record sources. It's another thing even for print. Um, but the second you, you get a camera and a crew involved, um, you know, people have a little bit more ambivalence about whether they're gonna talk. And so um, Abby and Sonia, I'd love for you to weigh in about, you know, how you approach these films and decided um, not only who would talk, but how you would get them to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Abby, did you want to start or? Sure. Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's it's a, it's like the second challenge, right? The first is to get to the information, and then the second is to be like, well, well, do you mind telling the world that with the camera in your face? And I think for me, I've in our film, we had multiple whistleblowers who'd never spoken before publicly about what had happened, um, and I spent a year. Uh, talking with them off the record. We had, you know, an ongoing off the record relationship where I was just building, you know, rapport with them and they, and they realized after so long that they could trust me. Um, but I didn't even, and I don't often, I didn't bring it up in our first meeting. It's not something that, that you bring up in the first meeting. I don't think I brought it up for, you know, 10 meetings, which might sound excessive for some films, but but, and I got a lot of no's. Um, and, and then when we did shoot on camera, they didn't tell us on camera what they, all of what they had said off camera. So it took multiple shoots with some of these people. And that just, you know, I think just respecting that this is a really big deal for some people um, and, and, and being very cognizant of that and being patient um, and trying to, if there's somebody you wanna talk to on camera, then you should, you should build that relationship ASAP, right? And just kind of, you know, be building it in the background um, while you're while you're uh, shooting everything else, and then and then you know fill them in maybe at the end. That's that's how I do it. Well, well, <laughs> that um, I think um, I guess when I show up, folks know that I want to put them on camera, so I don't have. To <laughs> the luxury of, um, of um, <laughs> coming in sort of incognito. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that patience, Abby, is really important and understanding that moment for, because there are folks who want to speak, right? And you know, you can kind of get in there and, and you know, it's a, you know, in that moment, um, they really feel like they're working with you. Um, and then um, there are folks who have something to say, but they're not quite sure they want the public to hear it, um, or they're conscious of their coworkers and, and family. Um, we had a lot to, of that to deal with because we were dealing with police officers, um, really. And I think for us, um, the family was incredibly important. And and really being respectful of their grief, but also their anger and well, not their anger, but what they were trying to resolve because oddly enough, I mean, they held their, their, um, their stance and their perspective in, in such a commanding way, um, manner 
that um, I also didn't feel um, that we could push there. You know, it's just sort of, for me, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a lot about sort of meeting people where they are, you know, um, and then sort of, um, and, and just pulling and, and, and having conversations from there. And not always will the information come. And so for us, there were multiple, you know, when we couldn't get all the information, let's say from, let's say initially going for family, um, police officers who knew um, um, Sean Souter, um, and then officers who were connected to any incidents that Souter might have been involved in with the GTTF, and then some of the GTTF folks who were involved in those incidents with Suda, maybe their family members. Um, trying to get a, a complete picture, that's where we started, where, where we aimed. Um, but as we were aiming in that direction, it became increasingly impossible uh, or unlikely to get access to uh, any, um, uh, many police officers um, who were tied to any of this information. Um, they were, of course, not willing to speak on camera, um, except for the former police commissioner and the, um, of course, the the, the friend. Um, I think um, getting the sort of like getting the fam, getting folks to speak. I'd rather not push too hard. It's, I just sort of accept what is what is given in some places and then just try to get the information in other places. So that's how we went. We ended up having to lean even more heavily, I believe, on the um, investigative reporters um, in the end than I even would would have would have. I'm not saying I would have not have liked to in, lean on the investigative reporters for the information they were given, but I would have liked to have seen more from um, some of the other folks who were directly involved with the case, but getting them to speak was, um, was really a challenge, e even after uh, multiple attempts to, uh, to speak with them. So, you know, in the end, um, I think using everyone's resources, Mark um, and, and Daphne and the blowback team had had uh, ends with um, the the law with the uh, law enforcement and with um, the federal um, officials, and so it was important to utilize their um, access to those folks to see you know if we could uh, get get it, get any information um, that way. But um, again, uh, these were these were challenges and. It's all like Mark. Can you add in, uh, add add on to what I was to what I've said about that? I know, I, not <laughs> much. I mean, I think you and Abby have summed it up. Uh, you know, it's it it's, and I think Harry, you know, said, look, uh, everybody's got their approach. I think the bottom line is trust, uh, and that's uh, difficult uh, when you're presenting multiple sides of the story because. Uh, a lot of people want their side of the story to be the story. And so to be uh, respectful and, uh, you know, to build trust, but also to be honest that there are going to be other voices. And some of those voices may well contradict what you feel is what happened. That's where it gets tricky. And certainly for police and law enforcement, it's very tricky. Uh, to get inside, uh, when you say GTTF, that's the Gun Trace Task Force that was involved in this, you know, police corruption. Uh, and speaking to those officers, uh, I don't think any of them was willing to really go on the record unless it was like just my story. I don't want anyone else. I don't want prosecutors. I don't want family members. I just want to tell it the way I saw it. So it is a trip balancing all of those voices. Yeah, and I feel like with these stories, there's always someone who got, you know, the, the source who got away, right? The source that you just couldn't get. And, and you find workarounds. And some of that is in the public record, right? A lot of, you know, news footage and things that people say or, you know, that it's just kind of right out there. And so there's, that's also the kind of the fun of it is trying to figure out like, okay, if you're not going to talk, then how are we going to get this, this on the record somehow? And I think that goes to one of the questions that came up. Um, and, and maybe Sarah, I'll kick this to you, which is, you know, one of the audience members has a question about, you know, how early do you get the lawyers involved when, like, what are the touch points about, you know, of when, 
you need to access your legal counsel along the way. Um, and, and Mark, you, you gave a laugh. So, so Mark and Dale can weigh in after about, um, you know, when filmmakers engage. And, and I think it's the answer, the shorter answer is it's not at the last minute, but go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Uh, well, Dale might have opinions on this too, but I, you know, when, when we work with him, it's, it's really ideally early on. Um, you know, he's not just a legal counsel that we go to at the end for, for a sort of legal blessing. Um, you know, he's involved in our editorial process. So he's aware of the stories that are coming. Um, you know, he's available, you know, we'll often come to him um, just for questions about, you know, we're approaching this, what do you think of that? Um, just to get his perspective. I mean, I think it's, it's always a good thing, um, you know, for us to have Dale's uh, perspective, you know, um, because he's also been through a lot of these stories, he's thought through a lot of these issues. Um, and so, you know, especially if we're approaching a particularly tricky uh, reporting task, um, you know, he's always um, got a, you know, great insight. Um, so I think it's important to have, you know, sort of a working relationship with your legal counsel rather than sort of coming to him at the end and saying, okay, sign off on all this stuff, right? It's, we're not going to get sued. Right? Cause that's, I mean, cause that's also the thing it's, you know, it's not about just sort of getting sued, but it's also making sure that you're doing, you know, your reporting in the most fair and transparent way, um, you know, for your own reputation and the reputation of the work. Um, you know, I think someone was saying earlier, the last thing you want is for, you know, your hard work to come out as a film and all anybody can talk about is, you know, how you unethically obtained that interview or how you didn't get this perspective or how you, you know, um, did a shady edit or something, right? It just undercuts the entire thing. Nobody wants to talk about anything else. Um, you know, so from the beginning, if you're saying, okay, we really want to do this in the most fair and transparent way possible, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're conducting ourselves in a fair and professional manner. Um, and so that if anybody looked back at our process, there'd be nothing we wouldn't defend, right? Um, you know, even if it's a tough editorial call and some people, you know, might argue with us about our approach, we always want to have a reasonable, thoughtful answer for why we did that thing. Um, and that's, you know, and that's where, um, you know, a council can be, can be helpful. I agree with what Sarah just said. And so I don't want to go over the same things, but I would say that waiting too long and coming in in the late stage process sort of defeats the whole idea of us working together well and, and often sets up an adversarial situation that that is the exact opposite of where I started today and where I really want to be with filmmakers. I want to be helping develop and, and find the way to get the story done the way the filmmakers envisioning it. And often if they're already locked into something, that's a problem for whatever reasons. Uh, now I'm the bearer of bad news and get to be the adversary. That's not my intention. And that, that's not a good way to use legal counsel. Mark, did you want to add anything? Uh, just another laugh uh, that uh, I, I, th I think Sarah, you know, said, said it well. Obviously, Frontline is gold standard uh, for uh, investigative documentaries. HBO, uh, their team who we work with, uh, also right up there, gold standard. Uh, you know, time is, uh, is something that we don't work under deadlines, you know, so we can engage uh, legal opinions. And of course, Sonia and I uh, and Daphne and Mario, we were dealing with lawyers. We were dealing with the family's lawyer. We were dealing with the cop's lawyer. We were dealing with federal prosecutors. We were dealing with the, the Baltimore uh, DA. So we needed to go, uh, you know, because we were getting all this contradictory input. We needed to go to HBO, to our own uh, in-house lawyers, you know, for some guidance on how to kind of continue the conversation since everybody on the other side had legal counsel right from the start. So I'm struck, we just have a few minutes left and there are some great questions about, you know, how to access the UCLA legal clinic and frontline um, and, and, you know, other great questions. But I, I do feel a bit of a responsibility here, which is on the one hand, I think we're all here to really encourage filmmakers to take on this work and to not be intimidated by it. And at the same time, every issue we're delving into really points to having a lot of resources. Um, and so I, I wanna kind of square that for our audience and not leave them hanging about, um, and, I, and I just love for each of you to give a quick tip as we just have about five minutes left. Um, 
you know, if you're just starting out and you don't have HBO or Frontline on your side um, or another strand, you know, what are the things that you can do to set yourself up for success to do this work? And, and we are trying to encourage people um, to tell their own stories in their communities, you know, so, so what's your kind of um, best practice for, for getting someone started um, to, to undertake this work, even though it, you know, it, it is resource intensive? Um, and so maybe, maybe Abby, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I think the best advice is to, um, you know, find a story. And if you, I think, like, if you hear of something that you think sounds like it's too crazy to be real, it might even, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, pull on that thread. Um, because in a lot of communities, you know, that you may be able to trace that back to something that's based in some truth and, um, you know, listen. And, and I think as soon as you find a good story, a strong story, something worth, you know, devoting resources to and bringing to a frontline or an HBO, then you're, you're good to go, but you need, you need the story first. And so, I, I always say just, you know, nothing is, is too crazy when you're in the field, what you hear um, and to just pull the threads as much as you can and, and talk to as many people as you can. That's a great tip, an investigative reporting tip because it's, yeah, follow, follow, you know, when people come to you with a crazy story, see if it's, see if there's a there there. Sonia. And I'll just add to that. I would say make sure that it is a subject matter that you are passionate about, that there is something here that you really are itching to find out yourself and that this sub, the, that the whole subject matter is just something that get, gets you because there are going to be many points of frustration, folks saying no, not, not answering your questions or in your initial ideas of how things may be, may be challenged. So, you know, and also go into the, the work with, a, 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 with, um, with an openness um, and a, a willingness to learn something, to be enlightened. Um, so I, I would say add those two bits on to what Abby said, and, and I think you'd have a lot of fun. Mark. Well, I have to agree. I, I, I think if you can start uh, with something personal uh, that has happened to you, your family, your neighborhood, uh, you were talking about local. I mean, there's so many local stories that are untold uh, that need to be unraveled. Uh, and then you already are the source and the access point. Uh, now you may not have the resources. I mean, just a, in my case, when I heard after 9-11, uh, uh, the cab driver tell me no Jews died. And uh, I was like, what are you talking about? And got in this conversation. And then I went to the deli around the street and my friends who were Arab uh, in the deli, I said, have you heard this? And they said, oh yeah, sure, no Jews died. Well, that was just the beginning of my own personal. I was like, personal, I, I can't believe this. How, like Abby was saying, I got to pull on the thread. Where does this lead? And that led to the protocols of Zion. Uh, so, I think that's one, but I just want to raise one other thing in thinking and listening to everybody. A lot of disinformation is now using the techniques of frontline HBO and, and, and making documentaries and making films. I mean, we're in a world now where we need investigative journalism more than ever. And yet it's up against disinformation, which is so massive uh, on social media and on media, and that has used a lot of the stylistic and, uh, and filmmaking approaches, uh, that it's really tricky. You can have all your sources, you can have two sources, you can have the journalism degrees, and yet somebody's gonna come up and say, oh no, that's, that's not true, here's, here's the real story. So. Uh, I'll just finish by saying, thank God Giuliani just got disbarred uh, and, and, and that there are some referees trying to say, you know, this is what's real and, and this is fake. Uh, but this is the new world we're in uh, and we do need it more than ever, but we also need a way to figure out how to mute the disinformation, which right. pretends to be investigative journalism. 
And, and you just dropped a piece of news on me that I've been living under a rock this morning. So I hadn't heard. So that's, so you, you left it here. So I'm, I'm going to ask um, the same question of Sarah and Dale. And unfortunately you have 30 seconds each and then, and then we'll wrap up. All right. Um, well, I would just say, um, it, you know, going back to Abby's suggestion to pull on the crazy conspiracy thread and 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 Mark to delve into that, um, do that, but then report against your assumptions. So anytime you've got a story that seems amazing, um, start reporting out the other side of that. Um, what evidence is there that it's not true? What about, you know, um, because that's the way you're going to really bulletproof your story. That's the way um, you're going to um, be able to confront you know, accusations that it's, you know, um, that it's ridiculous. I mean, that's one thing we do at Frontline all the time, reporting against our assumptions. It's so easy, even when we're trying to be fair and thorough, we all come into these stories with our own ideas. We're all looking, you know, um, you know, it's easy to, to see a clear villain and a clear hero, but reality often is not that way. Um, so report into your main character's background. Um, are there reasons why they're telling you this story? Um, they're always a more nuanced and fuller character and it'll be a better story. Um, it'll be a better story if your villain has um, motives for why they're doing that thing. And maybe maybe, maybe altruistic motives for being, um, you know, being the, the purported villain. Um, so report thoroughly um, into all of your characters in your story and, and you'll come up with something stronger and, and more powerful. And Dale. So I'll, I'll go for the resource side of things. I mean, I, I, I think that, that filmmakers need to apply the same passion to finding resources to help them get their projects done that, they, that you bring to your journalism and to your stories. I mean, my experience with, with the clinic, and by the way, you can go ahead and email me at cohen at, at law.ucla.edu. I didn't mean to, to, to tell anyone that you shouldn't try to reach out to us. We help as many filmmakers as we can. But there are lots of other organizations. AFI is one of them. Sundance is another. The IDA. There are just uh, literally you know, dozens of organizations that, that can help with funding, with expertise, with all sorts of other help and support for filmmakers. And with a little bit of digging, I would encourage everybody when they're getting started to go out and find the kind of help that they think they need. I think that it's an amazing community and there's lots of resources and help available, including the people on this panel. So I just want to thank you all for such a rich conversation. I feel like we could talk about this for another hour easily. Um, and congratulations to Sonia and Mark on the slow hustle. I hope everyone will look for it. And Ken, thank you for having us. And again, for um, pushing forward these ideas, which I know you have been doing for you know now on a decade or more um, to try to get us to, to do more of this work. So thanks, Ken, and thanks, AFI. Great, thank you, Carrie. You've done it again, another great panel. And yes, this is an invitation already for next year. Um, I really wanna thank Sarah, Dale, Abby, Mark and Sonia for a great conversation and for the work you're doing and Jill and Shannon for the great work they're doing interpreting. Um, and I, just an announcement that our next session is coming up in less than an hour at 4 p.m. Eastern, making films more accessible to all audiences. So we'll see our audience for that. And thank you to the audience for joining us. We'd love to hear from you on social media at hashtag AFI Docs. And you can check out our full lineup, including the slow hustle at docs.afi.com. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>